in our study in Romans. The stuff we've studied up to this point, kind of built up to this, and what we're studying here lays a foundation for everything that comes after it. So there are some critical things here in chapter 8 that we want to make sure we understand and uh, are grounded in these concepts and so forth uh, as we go through here. And some of these things we just kind of uh, introduce because as we continue through the rest of the study and in things that we're going to study after we finish the study in Romans, we'll always come back to this, refer back to these things because... The, some of these things uh, are hard, to, well really you can't e e do an exhaustive study all at once on those things. There are th things like, uh, for example, the creation evidence. That we, uh, we introduce concepts to our minds and that kind of forms a foundation for things that we learn and study after that foundation for our understanding. That's some of the things we're learning here as we go through chapter 8 about our sanctification and our, uh, our sonship growth and these other things. Uh, they form a, a foundation for our understanding. As we want to keep in mind that one of the main things we're doing here in this Bible study is learning proper framework and proper tools that will enable us to understand the Word, have a proper interpretation of it, and be able to learn it on our own, and have the confidence in our understanding in it, and not be, you know, swayed or, or uh, you know, tossed about by different things, and we'll have confidence in, and, and a growing apologetic defense of what we believe. You know, uh, I talked to a guy the other day at the museum, and uh, entered a conversation about some creation things and he kind of had the attitude like a lot of people do that well none of that stuff matters because you know I just believe it because the Bible says it. Well there's nothing wrong with that but we live in a world that doesn't care about the though well that's just the Bible what the Bible says. They don't care what the Bible says. If you can't show them some reasons why you believe what you believe not going to get any traction with them. So anyway a couple of weeks ago, we uh, had talked about some, remember we had the map up here, and we had kind of a history lesson, we talked about some of the things about uh, uh, Islam, and it, uh, this is after the Paris attacks, immediately after the Paris attacks, and we talked about that and so forth, and uh, you know, uh, of course nobody knew that now two weeks later, we'd be here and we've had one of those kind of attacks in our country. So, uh, I guess everybody's kind of in a conundrum over what to do about it. And you know, this, if nothing else, shows us that when you can see a problem, a growing problem, and there's a, really a potential problem if you don't do something about it, when you see that it could quickly and easily become a problem, it will become a problem that you can't do anything about. You know, it's like the, for example, the immigration problem. That went on for decades and decades and decades, and that was okay, as long as we were getting the cheap labor that, you know, did all the dirty jobs that nobody wanted to do for nothing. Well, it's not that way anymore, and uh, so, you know, it's a problem. Uh, and the, uh, you know, Europe has for decades and decades allowed these Muslim communities to just grow and grow and grow. And now they've taken over whole cities. And so now there, there's no way to control the radical element within the Muslim communities over there. Well, we've got the same thing in the United States now. You know, there are cities like Dearborn and, I don't know, places up in Michigan and other cities up there that have been completely taken over by Muslim communities. And, uh, you know... Six million of them in this country. Yeah. And That's a lot of if our government does not find some backbone somewhere and figure out some effective means to address the problem, 
the people will, and it's not going to be good, you know. So, uh, it's one of those things. They, you know, they let that go, they, and so now it's a huge problem. But a lot of these things factor into, you know, what we believe is the Bible uh, tells us about prophetic things and conditions coming up to the end times and. You know, I'm, I've learned to be very cautious about looking at current world events and say, oh man, this is the sign of the times, boy, this is the end time, this is the last days, da, da. Jesus is coming back. Yeah. I've learned to be very cautious about that. Because a lot of the things that we see in history have happened before. It, it's cyclical. And what the... Islam is trying to do now, they've always been trying to do throughout their whole history. They've always been trying to take over Europe. They've always been trying to take over the world. They want to, the, the religion wants to dominate the world for Islam. That's a, one of their core beliefs. A lot of them will deny it, but that's one of their core beliefs. It would be like, it would be like for Christians, I guess there are some Christians that would say this, but that would be like, you know, evangelical Christians, us, to say, oh, no, we, we don't want to convert people to Jesus Christ. We don't want to preach the gospel all over the world and see people come to Christ. Oh, no, that's not what... That is what, you know, one of our... It's like the core of our main motive. Yes, we want to do what we can to, uh, you know, communicate the gospel message to everybody everywhere we can so that they can hear the truth and come to Christ and be saved. So, you know, for us to deny that is like the Muslims denying that Islam has, a, has a, one of its foundational tenets to dominate the entire world. So, anyway, uh, you know, I you don't really want to get on a soapbox about that, but here's another one of the problems. Too many people, and I'm talking about preachers standing in behind wooden things with a cross on the front, have been too afraid to say anything or they didn't want to say anything because it's controversial or whatever or they thought well they're just going to preach Jesus and that's let all the other stuff go ignore all the other stuff and there's too been, been too many people who just buried their head in the sand and pretended like well it will just go away and well, I'm not going to say anything well, so the Bible says you got to love your neighbor so yeah yeah, yeah so love our neighbor doesn't matter neighbor. that they're trying to chop your head off you know <laughs> So, you know, and yeah, we're, I mean, we're supposed to love our enemies and all that stuff. But at the same time, that does not negate our responsibility to protect our the foundations of our law-abiding society, you know. So, uh, and I know we've got a lot of problems in America. Hopefully we can vote the main one out, in a, you know, about a year from now. Amen. But, uh... Well, he'll be gone one way or another if we don't wind up with one that's worse. But, uh, you know, America, uh, our Constitution is still the best government that men have ever come up with. It's still, you know, still the best place to live. But, you know, if something doesn't happen, it won't be. So, anyway, that's the political soapbox for tonight. I guess we can move on to the Bible study. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Um... You may want to go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8 because although you know, we've got the scriptures up here, um, we may want to look at, be able to refer back to a you know, larger section passage than the individual scriptures will have on the uh, board. So uh, let's go ahead and end this tonight and... Uh, We'll see how far we get. There's a lot of important things in here to talk about a number of times. And it, it's important, you know, it's important for us to work our way slowly through these things because especially as we get into Romans chapter 8, it can be a confusing mass of stuff that we either don't relate to or we don't understand or it can be easily misunderstood or misinterpreted. So... <laughs> You know, with with caution of not getting bogged down in the minutia of every meaning of every word and all those kind of things, and trying to you know make some progress uh, with balance to make sure we don't just 
go right past things that are important for us to learn and understand. So, with that, we'll proceed forward. Um, We, uh, we left off last week, we, we read through to verse 24, so we're going to back up a little bit to verse 22, and we'll pick back up there. It says, For we, uh, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And it still is today. We, this coming off of what he said, for, you know, the, the, the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. So as... Adopted sons and daughters, we are being equipped and trained for our vocation in the heavenly places, which is going to have something to do with the restoration of the of, of the creature, mainly you know in the that part in the heavenly places that has been corrupted by sin and you know Satan's influence, just like the earth has. So we we know now how do we how do we know this? Well. For one thing, you know, Paul's told us that that's the case. Uh, but we also know this because we can see it. I mean, we can see, okay, as we believe the biblical account of creation and how God created the earth, the heaven and the earth, and it was good. He, every, every day, everything he created, he looked at it and said it was good. Oh, no. Finally, after day six, when the creation was finished, he looked at it and said it was very good. So now if God says it's very good, you can be sure of one thing. It's very good. It's, it was complete. It was whole. It functioned in the way it was designed to function. And it was productive. Every part of it was productive and uh, worked together to uh, make it produce what God wanted it to produce. And it would have had it not been corrupted by sin, Adam's sin. So, I mean, we can... The fact that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now... and and we, we can see it. You know, we can experience it. We are part of the creation. <clears throat> we groan and travail. You know, I mean, dogs chew our hands off. And we, you know, hurt our backs. And we get, we get injuries that haunt us for the rest of our life. And all kind of things like that. You know, because we live in a corrupted world. So, you know, we, uh, we're with that. Groan and travail and pain. And... Till now, and, you know, in the travail is the uh, the word that signifies, you know, like a, a woman in labor, getting ready to give birth, and so forth. Uh, in that, the like the whole creature is anxious for the next thing that's going to happen, which is when the Lord will return and He's going to straighten all this mess out. Groan here is to I just copied the. The uh, definition right out here to put it on. So it's to make uh, in, to put in straight to you know like that restrict or to sigh or to murmur, pray inaudibly with grief, uh, you know, or groan <clears throat> like with a, a grudge or heavy sighing, things like that. And uh, Crab synonyms. He said the groan proceeds involuntarily as an expression of extreme pain, either of body or mind. Here's a, an example. You know, Thursday, when we turned on the news and all this stuff going on, we heard about what had been done in uh, San Bernardino. And you think of your reaction, just, oh, you know, like that, that's a, it, it's like something that just comes, comes out of you that just... Uh, like a sinking down. It's hard to describe, but it, you know, it's almost like you can't even say anything. A grief and a sadness, or if you've ever, you know, ever experienced some kind of a tragedy, bad news, things like that. That's what that groaning. It just, it. You don't have to try to do it. It just happens. You know, like a natural response to pain or grief and things like that. So. That in mind, that that is a sense of the, you know, the, the whole creation groans. And travails in pain until now. Now, in verse 23, it said, Not only they, not only the creature, <clears throat> but ourselves also. So, like I said, we're part of that too. We groan and travail in pain until now. Because from what we believe, the Bible teaches us, 
that there's something better coming, that uh, we're going to receive glorified bodies. Uh, it, it, you know, it will be these bodies we have, but they're going to be in a glorified form. We won't have all the ailments and sicknesses and injuries and, uh, uh, you know, results of aging and all those kind of things that we all suffer through uh, in these bodies. They'll, they'll all be corrected. They'll be gone. We'll have glorified bodies like Christ's resurrected body. So, <clears throat> ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting, waiting for the adoption of, to wit, the redemption of our body. So see, just as our spiritually we, re, we receive an adoption as sons, where you know we're uh, accepted uh, into, like I guess you could say, the family business. You know, we, we grow up to a point where, you know, God gives us responsibility. And uh, we're... We receive a, a you know greater understanding of things, greater insight. Um, we understand the liberty we have in Christ to take responsibility, to make decisions, and uh, pursue the gifts we have and abilities we have to labor with our heavenly Father to accomplish the will. So. Uh, that adoption we have, but also our body, our physical body, is waiting for its adoption to, you know, uh, sonship. Its adoption is the redemption of our body. So even our corrupted physical bodies, like our spirit was redeemed when we came to Christ, our body will be redeemed as well. Either whether we're resurrected, if we, you know, die before... Uh, the Lord returns, or if we're alive and He returns and we're, you know, changed and taken up. Either way, uh, we're waiting because it, we understand that from our understanding of the Bible. That's what it teaches us. And so, uh, you know, and to not, to not understand that kind of puts us on a, I don't want to really say wrong course, incorrect course. Uh, it's very easy for us as, well, people, but even as Christians, who should know better, it's very easy for us to just get focused on the things of the world. You know, um, making sure that, I don't know, uh, we... we Seek for security and, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe go overboard and, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is kind of developing the attitude like we think we're just going to live forever. Like we think nothing's ever going to happen. We're never going to get sick. We're not going to get old. <laughs> like we think we're not going to die. That's just not the reality of it. So, it's, and, and there's nothing wrong. I'm not, not saying we shouldn't be prepared, you know, and take care of what we need to, take care of our bodies and all those kind of things. We should. We should do all that. But we should have a, we, we should have a different kind of a spiritual worldview or, you know, uh, viewpoint to understand that, look, look this, this is not, this, this world, this physical world is not our priority. There's something better coming, and we're, being prepared now for what we're going to be able to do when we receive the redemption of our body. Uh, now, the first fruits, he says, we which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we want to make sure we're not confused about this, that the first fruits of the Spirit is not the same thing as the fruit of the Spirit that we find over in Galatians 5, where it says, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, uh, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, those things, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. But the first fruits of the Spirit, the, the first things that happen, the first things we get from the Spirit working in us 
are our justification, our sanctification, and our, our glorification. Now, we haven't received our glorification yet, because that's this right here, when we receive our glorified body. But we have the promise of it, of this happening. That, you know, the Lord has promised us this in Christ, and we believe that, that, we, will, that we will have it. Uh, so the first fruits, those of us that we understand about our sanctification and our glorification and in these things, because you know we've received the first fruits, we've been taught about those things, we understand those things, even though we understand this and we know that we're going to receive the you know glorification of our physical body, still even with that. We still groan within ourselves because we uh, are affected. We can't not be affected by the things that are happening in this world. But if you remember what we talked about last night, one, last week, one point I made is that verse 18 gives us kind of a context for everything that follows it. Because, okay, you know, even though we have the first fruits, still, even at that, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. But remember that Paul said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Even though we know this, but still, we, we can't help but groan within ourselves. Now, you know, some little, now i got arrows up here. Okay, the sufferings of this present time, well, we know that that's what's happening now. And it would happen to Paul back then and, you know, all of his contemporary people and the Christians then. Well, it's been happening to Christians ever since then. And the sufferings of this present time, and we could go into a lot of what that is. It's, uh, you know, probably includes just the normal... Every day, you know, wear and tear on our bodies and other things we suffer. The distresses, the mental distresses, like all this stuff we're going through now. All of us are, you know, experiencing a level of mental distress over the conditions in the world. And we know that there's this growing enemy that hates us. Hates us because of what we believe. Hates us because we're Christians and because we believe this Bible is true. And uh, there are a lot of them, a lot of them, that if they have the opportunity, they will kill us. So the, all of that's part of the sufferings of this present time. And that's happening now, during the dispensation of grace. And But the glory which shall be revealed in us is going to happen, you know, down here. Well, you could kind of put that error here. In Christ's return... Because when we're resurrected or changed, really, it would be more accurate to have that arrow. Oh, excuse me. Let's just put it. Uh, yeah, we'll just go right up here. Because that's really when we're going to you know, receive our glorified body and so forth. So, I wanted to put this verse on the board. Because we want to make sure we refer back to that as we're going through these other verses and keep this in mind. It's kind of a context of where we're going with this. All right. Now, we talk about that. Verse 24. He says, For we're 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 saved by hope. And this, here again, we want to make sure we understand the the word usage there of saved, it doesn't always mean saved like we generally think of our, you know, soul saved, our justification unto eternal life. Uh, it kind of has both meanings here. That say justification unto eternal life and also physical salvation, our physical deliverance. And that's more the context here, the word usage of saved here, it's sozo, the Greek word, sozo. And it means a physical deliverance. So, our the redemption of our bodies, physical deliverance for us, is something that we have it 
by hope. Uh, none of us have seen it. You know, hope that is seen is not hope. It, you know, I don't, I don't have to hope for a nifty little you know school pointer because I have it right here in my hand. Now, if I didn't have one of these, you know, and, and Julie told me she's going to buy me one, then I would have the hope that I was going to receive one someday. Maybe for Christmas, you know. Make a pretty good stocking stuffer. <laughs> uh, so, the redemption of our body, we believe that we're going to receive that, even though we haven't seen it. Uh, this is what we see, we don't hope for it. But we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And this is kind of like instructional. Okay, we haven't seen it. We None of us have ever even seen anybody in a glorified body. Now, it's possible that some of the people Paul wrote to, they may have been among that group of people that saw Jesus in his glorified body. They, you know, I mean, these were Roman believers, but... Uh, you know, he said Jesus appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters all at once. So it, it's very possible and likely that some of the people he was writing to had actually seen Jesus in his glorified body. So they knew what it looked like and uh, had experienced that. Well, none of us ever have. We've never seen anybody in a glorified body. But we believe that we'll receive one. And here's one of the reasons why we have this hope, and it's sure, is because the other two first fruits of the Spirit, we have experienced our justification. We've come to Christ, and we've, uh, you know, received His life, His Spirit uh, living in us. We've been redeemed. We, we've experienced that justification. We're experiencing sanctification. Listen, if, if you weren't going through the process of being sanctified, you wouldn't understand any of this. I wouldn't understand any of this if it wasn't for the Spirit of God working in us to, you know, open our understanding and... Teach us the fundamental tools and frameworks we need to bring it all together and understand it. Also, uh, you know, there are issues of prayer, and we're going to talk about that, you know, later on in the study. And uh, other things about our, uh, our, our different attitudes, uh, wisdom we learn. The godliness, the godly thinking and godly living and godly laboring with the Father uh, that we have evident in us, those things wouldn't be there if we weren't in the process of being sanctified. Uh, if you weren't going through the process of sanctification, I guarantee you, you would not come here every Monday night and listen to me stand up here and teach the Bible. So, if it didn't mean, if, if it means something, and you're understanding it and growing in the Word, that's our sanctification in action. It it's working and it works. You know, it's not always you know flamboyant and you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, well, anyway, big you. You know, emotional outbursts and all that kind of stuff. Charismatic sometimes. Some, you know, sometimes it may be, but not always. Our sanctification is, uh, is solid, steady growth and learning. Okay. So we hope, we, we have a great hope uh, that we're, we, we're not going to, our bodies are not going to be in this condition forever. They will be changed and we'll receive a glorified body. And uh, it will be, a, you know, a great thing not to suffer the things we do, not have the limitations that we do in these physical bodies, and we will be able to then carry out the things that we're, you know, designed to be able to do, and it will be great. Uh, you know, I think we're gonna, when we're in our glorified bodies, I think we're gonna, we're, because I believe we're gonna remember. 
I don't think we're going to be that much different as far as our person. We're going to keep our personality. Who we are now, that's who we're going to be then. We're just going to be like Christ, you know. <laughs> be in a glorified state. We'll be more like Christ. And I think we're going to look back and say, how in the world did I live all those years in that thing? <laughs> how did we function? How did we operate at all, you know? Mm. So, anyway, we have a great hope. Uh, something good to look forward to. All right. So, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, but we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, whole lot in here in this. I'm not going to try to exhaust it all. We're going to hit some of the high points. Um, important for us to understand the, the things that have led up to this because they're generally a, a kind of a lot of misunderstanding and misinterpretation surrounding this verse and what it means. Now, in our general thinking, we think of infirmities as you know physical sicknesses or diseases or so forth. And it is that. But here it, it is more our weaknesses. Now remember, in the context, it's uh, talking about infirmities specifically. And it's our weaknesses to a, accomplish the things that, number one, you know, we would like to accomplish. But our infirmities to uh, produce godliness and righteousness and, and in our, I guess what we want to say is our weaknesses and inabilities to uh, produce the things that sanctification will produce in us. That God's plan and purpose and His way of working will produce in us things that we can't. We're because, you know, we're weak. We're weak because we're in these, these bodies uh, and we're, we're affected by that. Uh, we're weak because we're part of the creature that groans and travails together until now, waiting for the redemption of our body, you know, and so forth. Uh, so the Spirit helps our weaknesses in those things. Now, I know a lot of times we tend to want to take this, and here again, we've got to remember that especially here, And I'm going to say this because I've done it too. Years past, you know, it's very easy to go in here and take a verse like this and pull it out of there and stand it up on its own, build a sermon around it and, you know, preach the Spirit. Helps our infirmities so that whenever we're sick or whenever we're weak or whenever, you know, dog bites us in the hand or whatever, things like that. Uh, I've got one too right there. Mine's not as bad as yours. <laughs> dog got me right there. I think I was... I remember I was trying to get a bone away from her. So. <laughs> They'll do it. <laughs> or play with her. Our dog had her operation this week, so she's a pitiful. You know. The cone of death. <laughs> yeah. You know, the cone didn't work out too good. She just, you know, dig it into the ground, so we took the cone off. She's been fine. She's all right. She's just mad at me because I won't let her go outside and run around and play and all that. So anyway, she's doing good. But it's very easy to, to just say our infirmities means all of our physical ailments and all those kind of things, and the Spirit helps us in our, you know, when we're sick and all those kind of stuff. Now, we can't say that no, He doesn't, but uh, that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, now, the Spirit helps us, our infirmities, this is related to immediately what comes after it is a four. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. So our not knowing what we should pray for as we ought has to have something to do with our weaknesses and our inabilities to you know, accomplish the things God's wanting to accomplish in us. And the, uh, the things that make us you know, groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So... These, these things are the weaknesses, the infirmities, kind of in a nutshell of what he's talking about uh, up here. So, we don't, 
Oh, okay. As far as us being weak in these things, not knowing what to do, and not having the ability to do it, it even goes to the extent that we're not even sure of what we should ask for relating to those things. Uh, this ties into some things Paul talked about over there in mm, Philippians, I think, where, you know, he uh, made statements such as, you know, I'm kind of in a, uh, a, a straight. He had kind of a conundrum. He said whether to stay here, which is better for you, or to depart and be with the Lord, you know. So in that sense, that's kind of a sense here too. You know, one of the things that we don't know what we should pray for as we ought because we're in such straits and we're in such a, uh, you know, groanings over the conditions we're in and, and all these things and the sufferings of this present time, we don't know whether we should pray for God to, you know, take us through it or take us out of it, you know. And listen, you know, Paul even said, he said, I would... Him and some of his companions at times things got so bad that he said, We despaired even of life. And this is the Apostle Paul. It was under such tribulation and distress that he was just tired and just tired of living. He wished he could just die, you know. So there's that sense in here because those, you know, the Roman uh, Christians there, they were uh, they were under persecution. I mean, they were singled out and so forth. In fact, it probably wasn't very long after Paul wrote this letter and sent it to Rome that uh, Emperor Claudius uh, kicked all the Jews out of Rome, made them leave, made all of them. It was, you know, Anna, uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they left there and went to Corinth, I think, is where they ended up and you know, so forth. But anyway, so... Uh, the Spirit helps our infirmities, our weaknesses, but we don't even know what we should pray for as we ought. Now, there's another whole issue here, and we're going to address this as we go on in the study too, about as uh, mature sons and daughters, how should we pray? Uh, how, how can we effectively pray? And uh, this is... It's really good, and it's things that uh, we really need to know and, uh, and study because there are some effective ways of prayer that we need to understand and how to pray and why to, why to pray this way and so forth. Uh, and it's a lot different than our Christian culture customarily designs, directs uh, praise. And, you know, generally, I mean, y'all have all been to the prayer meetings. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to, you know, show concern for people when they're having distresses and things like that. I'm not saying it's, you know, we shouldn't pray for people when they're sick or hurt and in trouble and all those kind of things. But uh, there's, there, there's a, there's just, there's something different. There's a higher level of more effective uh, prayer for us that understand some of these things about sonship that we need to know. We'll, we'll cover those things coming up. Uh, one of the things, reason that they didn't know what to pray for as they ought, because Paul hadn't taught them yet. And he's going to teach them very specific things about prayer, how they should pray and how we should pray. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Let's see. Let me go ahead and go to my definition. I think. Wait a minute. Yeah. Well, let's look at this one. Uh, infirmities, you know, feebleness of mind or body, malady, you know, or morally or frailty, disease, infirmity, sickness, or weakness. So it can cover a lot of things. Let's see. I already, we already looked at Groanings, right? Yeah, so anyway, same definition. Uh, uh, an expression that comes out of a, you know, a deep distress or, or grief and things like that. 
uh, you know, tri tribulation. So, <clears throat> but the Spirit makes an intercession for us. Now, with groanings, not necessarily just that, you know, the Spirit is making the groanings, but pretty much it's with our groanings too. There's that sense too as well. So we don't want to, you know, don't want to miss that. Uh, and we want to make sure we understand that, this, you know, the, the groanings is not, it, it, we get this picture and it's, you know, What do we think? Now, this has been a, if we'd admit it, this has been one of those kind of verses or section of a verse that's often been a little bit hard to understand. We've looked at this, we've read it, and we've thought, what in the world does that mean? I know I always have. You know, what, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that, okay, the Spirit of God that interacts between us and God the Father, does that mean that He knows the troubles and things that we're going through, and he's so distressed over it that the the spirit is in communicating with God on our behalf and just oh, you know groaning like that, or he can't even say anything. Is so distressed with grief and all that. Nah, that's that's not it. Uh, you know, that's not it. Uh oh. I don't have a heart attack. <laughs> be under terrorist attack. <laughs> Alarm goes off. I don't imagine Frost, Texas is real high on the terrorist target, but you never know. Those people in San Bernardino probably didn't think they were either. Uh, Carson, I've got a personal experience that kind of fits this verse. Uh, it says, uh, there, Likewise, the Spirit also uh, help us our infirmities, mm -hmm. for we know not what we should pray for. Mm -hmm. For as we all, but the Spirit itself makes make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, or which cannot be uttered. I remember in 2009, after the second round of cancer that I went through, uh, I did bottom. It hit me with ke uh, chemo and radiation, yeah. and it was just to the point to where I thought, God, if I could just go through. And I, I made the prayer. I said, George, God, just take me today. Mm -hmm. Take me today. I'm tired of suffering. I want to go home. Yeah. And I opened my eyes from that prayer and I thought, well, crap, he left me here. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought to myself, and that, that pretty much says that, okay, you know you're on bottom, but then it says, but the Spirit itself make us intercession for us with mm -hmm. groanings, which yeah. cannot be uttered. Yeah. And I got to think, and I've, I've had, had a problem since that time. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I'm saying, talking about the, mm -hmm. you not know how to pray for it. So I said, it's in your hands, mm -hmm. whatever you do, it's fine. I'm ready to go home. Yeah. And he left me here. Yeah. So that was the making of the intercession for us, groanings which cannot be uttered. There was nothing said. Yeah. It was his will that yeah. I stayed here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And the groanings would go back to. Uh, that we as part of the creature, we groan within ourselves, sure, right. waiting for what? Waiting for the redemption of our body. Right. That's waiting for that time when this right. stuff's not going to happen anymore. I'm through. I'm tired. Right. You know, and 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 so, you know, like that. There, there's nothing wrong because I would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I said, God, I'm tired of this. Mm -hmm. Just, but it's out, it's out of my hands. It's in His hands. Yep. Yeah. So. Now, that being said, let's go back over here to our context. Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, whatever they are, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So, you know, we have this hope that whatever we go through, that we're going to look back on it and it's going to seem like nothing, you know? Uh, so, uh, how do you make it through stuff like that if you don't have that faith? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. A lot of people do. You know, I mean, there's Christians that, that uh, I mean, I mean, unbelievers that go through cancer or whatever, you know, they never pray or anything. They, you know, they make it through and all that kind of stuff. But, 
You know, I, I wonder how. But uh, part of the thing that our hope rests on is the fact that the Spirit does, you know, intercede for us uh, along with our groanings because of, along with things we don't understand, we can't know, we would never be able to say it happens. Now, here's another thing, and I almost forgot about this. Here's one of the things we want to make sure that we don't miss while we're going through this chapter. Here's something that begin, really begins to come together in chapter 8. Let me go ahead and put it up here while I'm thinking about it. <coughs> I'm just put it like this. All three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, we, we, we've looked at, we've established, well, really even in chapter 6 and 7, uh, we're, we're in Christ, and uh, that the, uh, the things, that the work that has been completed in Christ enabled God to justify us freely and it's also enabled Him to sanctify us and start us in that process of sanctification. This is God has done working through the Son and now through the Holy Spirit. So these things we're seeing happen uh, are, are a culmination of all three persons of the Godhead all coming together to work together in us. And the things that God is accomplishing in us, in our sonship, are things that are done through the action and working of all three. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this also we want to keep keep in mind as we're going through here. Alright, let's see. Um, let's go ahead and go through these next two verses because I want to hit on those and then we'll uh, we'll come back and pick up on those next week. Um, yeah, there's a... Okay. Let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead. Talk about, about groanings. This illustrates that to us, What kind of what we're talking about. Uh, back in Judges 2, the Lord raised them up judges. The Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies. All the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. So we get a sense of that. Now, let's go back to uh, verse 27, or continue, verse 27. That's how God dealt with Israel then. He raised up judges and stuff, and they, you know, they're, they're crying out to God because of the oppression of their enemies and so forth, and He delivered them out of it. Of course, this was during the cycles of judgment, and then they, you know, went back to idolatry and went through the cycles and so forth like that. So he deals with us differently now. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So here, here again, uh, here we find uh, God the Father and the Spirit working together in us. He that searcheth the hearts. Now, uh, I've heard kind of this taught as that we're supposed to search our own hearts. That we're the ones that search our hearts. Wait just a minute. This is where we need to get a biblical context on this. First Chronicles 28, 9. <clears throat> thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts. Understand the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found in thee. Thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Also in Jeremiah 17.10, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. 
I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You might remember, uh, this may be one of your memory verses, Jeremiah 17, 9, says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. So we're talking about he that searcheth the hearts. Back here in Romans, uh, maybe going the wrong way. He that searcheth the hearts, that's talking about the Lord God. So he, he knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Now, this also gives us an indication that the, the main person of the Godhead that we're dealing with today is the Spirit of God. God the Father is not on the earth. He's not coming down in fire and thunder and trumpets and everything onto the mount, top of the mountain of, and you know, speaking to the people and giving tablets of stone and He's not in the temple anymore. His glory departed out of that. He left the earth at that time. And He didn't come back. God the Father is seated on His throne in heaven. That's where He is. God the Son is not physically operating in the earth today. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, where He will be until He arises from His seat to return to the earth and judge His enemies. So, now the person of the, uh, of the Godhead that's Working in the earth today is the Holy Spirit. That's the one that's uh, God is working through His or by His Spirit through His Word in our inner man uh, to accomplish His will. So <clears throat> He that searches the hearts, God knows the mind of the Spirit, the intents, the thoughts, the. Uh, Plans, motives, the ways that the Spirit is working and so forth. Because He makes intercession for the saints, here's the key phrase right here. According to the will of God. So if we go all the way back up here to where we were, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We know not we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh Intercession for us with groanings cannot be uttered. We go back to here that he's making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So, not only does that tell us that he's interceding for us, but not just to ask God to do what we want Him to do or, or to just make things easier for us, but the intercession that He's making on our behalf is for this purpose. It's according to the will of God. So, if we're suffering through something, the sufferings of this present time, if we're going through those things and in our groanings we cry out to God, uh, even just understanding why we're going through these things and it won't stop, it won't quit, or we can't find a solution for it, then it may be that according to the will of God, He's using those things to teach us patience. It's what we saw over there in Romans 5, 1, where tribulation works patience and patience hope and those kind of things like that. You know, we... All right. When we were kids, I mean, everybody in here, you know, grew up working. We all we all worked and did things. Uh, hard, you know, hard work. Now, a lot of that hard work that we did, uh, it it may not have been things that that absolutely had to have been done. But our parents, grandparents, people we worked for, whatever, they understood something maybe we didn't understand. They understood that, that uh, while maybe some task, chore, job or something, hard work, may not necessarily have been all that vital to the operation of whatever we were doing, it was vital for teaching us character and patience and work ethic and those kind of things. It's, it's like uh, I heard a story one time. I wish I could remember it. Basically, in a nutshell, uh, it was a, a farmer and he... Uh, he planted a, a, a lot of corn. He had cornfields. Planted all his corn. And uh, 
he had a family, he had you know sons and kids and so forth. And uh, somebody, a uh, neighbor, somebody said, Farmer Jones, whatever, why are you plant all that corn? You don't need all that corn. And he said, uh, well, I'm really not raising corn. I'm raising sons. <laughs> <laughs> and they need something to do, you know. So here's the thing. Not that God wants us to needlessly suffer or have to endure anything, but listen, sonship principles are sonship principles. Whether it's in human terms, <laughs> or raising our kids and making them work or have to endure hardships and things like that. I'm talking about, you know, winning reason, not being oppressive or mean or anything like that. But making them endure hardships and learn how to work, it, we know it's for their own good. Uh, there, there are things that as human beings we are not going to learn if we don't learn it the hard way. <laughs> I know for me, all of my lessons in life all seem to be hard and expensive. I never got any cheap, easy lessons. I guess because we don't remember the cheap, easy lessons. We only remember the hard, expensive ones, painful ones. So anyway, same thing applies. So we want to keep that in mind when we're, we're looking at these verses here. And yes, the Spirit makes intercession for us. And, uh, you know, we grown within ourselves, waiting for the, uh, we're just, there's something in the back of our minds, we should be glad when this is all over with, so tired of all the distress in the world, and all that stuff. So, within that, what the Spirit is going to do, His working in us, what He's teaching us, His intercession for us, is going to be for the purpose of, of accomplishing God's will in our lives. Sometimes that will includes things that have to build patience and endurance and uh, trust and hope and uh, those kind of things that only that don't come easy. They only come hard. Uh, but it's necessary. You know, with what we may face in the future, uh, we better have some endurance. We better have. We better develop some toughness, and we better develop some uh, willingness. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have that, but I'm just saying we better make sure we do uh, to to stand our ground and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, let's go to this last. Well, let's see. Read that. Okay, I tell you what, we're just going to stop right there because I need to come back to this next week and pick back up here because there are some things in Ephesians three. In fact, here's your homework: read Ephesians chapter three. No worksheet or test, but uh, make yourself a note this week in your Bible reading. Read Ephesians chapter three, and that will kind of prepare us for uh, what we come back to next week. So we'll stop here and. Uh, Pick, pick up there next time. All right. Anybody got any uh, additions or comments or anything? No. Carol McCarthy was uh, just replying to her made a statement. The things that you in your life that you go through, it's easy. You don't mm -hmm. remember. Yeah. It's the ones that's tough that yeah. you lay or yeah. implant embedded into your yeah. Yeah. brain. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. And it, I mean, yeah. It, that's just the way it has to be. It's the only thing that's effective. That's the only effective means of teaching us. You know. I think that's one thing that's wrong with society Tough today. Is is they, they don't worry about tomorrow. They just take care of today. But, yeah. You know, those bumps in the roads and stumbles as you go through, you remember them. Yeah. The old saying is, if it don't kill you, it just makes you stronger. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, within all that, we, uh, we have... We have to stay on top of some things because distressing things, tribulations, problems, troubles, all those things, they will have an effect on us. We cannot be immune from those things. But we have the choice. Will we let them make us bitter and resentful? Or will we let them 
produce that, you know, uh, uh, patience and, and hope and, and those kind of things. Godly character type character and those kind of things in us. That's a choice we make. So, you know, uh, because we, we can't go through life unaffected by these things. They will affect us one way or another. So, all right. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed.